So welcome everybody to our uh, GIS info session. So this is, uh, we're gonna be talking about our advanced diploma as well as the Bachelor of Technology, which uh, you can either do here at BCIT or we do have a part-time studies uh, option as well where you can take the courses online. Uh, my name is Carl Kloparchuk. I'm the program head for the uh, GIS uh, department. Uh, and uh, as well as we have our part-time studies coordinator, Carmen Heaver, uh, she's at the back. So if you have any uh, questions for us, uh, maybe after uh, we finish our presentation, uh, that you can talk to either one of us. Um, before I start um, through my presentation, what I thought I would do is show to you um, two short videos that I had just uh, uh, developed over the summer with two of our alumni. One is in private industry and one is works for the uh, the BC government and show those uh, two videos just to start off with. See what they say. I graduated from the BCIT GIS program in 1995. I entered the program after uh, graduating from my post my grad undergraduate in geography from the University of Western Ontario. I really wanted to advance my skill sets in GIS and contemplated uh, going for my master's, um, which would have been a great decision, but I think the shortcoming is I would have learned a lot of the theory, but not had a way to practically apply it. So I sought out BCIT as a, a GIS program, and it was exactly what I expected. I got hands-on uh, knowledge and theory together with the opportunity to work for, uh, for an industry partner through a co-op program. Um, I was hired almost directly out of the program, and I think that coming to BCIT for GIS was really a, a critical point a success point in my life. Um, it really opened the door to where I am today and we uh, have hired five students from the BCIT program through the practicum uh, internship opportunity over the last four years. Michael Simon and now we'll look at our BC government person. Graduating from a GIS program at BCIT, um, getting a first job with the provincial government in '99 in November. Basically, I graduated. I my program was uh, I, I started in '98, May '98. I came from uh, from Germany at that time. I just landed as an immigrant here to Canada, so it was all new actually, new country, new program everything coming together, adjusting to the life here. So I started in May 98. Actually, no, it's in September 98 I started, and I graduated in 99. The program was very intensive. I did not have the luxury to take some prep courses in programming, and I didn't realize how much programming it will involve. But I think uh, I got a lot of help, actually. People were very helpful, all the students, you know, they work together. It's a very collaborative environment. And the teachers are also very supportive, so, you know, um, for example, I didn't have a computer and the, I didn't know that assignments have to be submitted. You type it up and then you have to submit it and type up. I just wrote it in hand and submitted it and it was not accepted. So that was my first lesson. You need to, <laughs> you need to, uh, adopt, to, the, to uh, adopt basically the tools and technology which is required to do, to, to do your coursework. Anyways, I graduated in 98. My first job was in, Nanaim, in, in Nelson, which is almost 1,000 kilometers from here. So that was a four month term, it was a GIS technician. And from there, once you're in the organization, people know you, your capabilities, your skills, you know, networking help, you establish those networks. As I said to you earlier, there are eight different offices. So they were looking for somebody in Surrey at that time. C2 Sky land use plan, which this map is uh, from, it is from November 27, 2001 actually. And I'll speak to that in a bit. So when I was in Nelson, they were looking for somebody in Surrey office. And that's, uh, and I am from Surrey, I wanted to come back. So I landed a job here, that was a one year term position. And uh, all it evolved into a permanent position. 
it was a GIS analyst position. I was an analyst for about three, four years, and then I became a GIS coordinator. I was in coordinator position for about four years, and then I became GIS managers, and I've been in managers since uh, then, basically eight years now, nine years. So it is an evolution from a technician to a manager over the course of last 17 years. And I think the program at BCIT really gave me a solid foundation, not only in the technical aspects, but also things like project management, communication, um, presentation, how to present, and also networking opportunities. For example, I learned through the GIS program that you know you need to become member, student member, for example, for some um, GIS organizations like uh, Urban and Regional Information Systems uh, Association. It has uh, URISA, which we call. URISA has a local chapter, and I joined. And I still remember there was only four people at that point on the executive, and I was one of the youngest one, a student member. And I think and I, I remained part of that organization for the last uh, 15 years. And it was immensely helpful. I get, in, get to know all the GIS managers across uh, the lower mainland. So, that's my brief, in, in nutshell, my history, you know, in terms of how I took the program and where I am now. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And I, when I look back, it may sound really challenging and hard, but I think it is worth it to go through that rigor, rigorous training. That was uh, Gurdeep from GOBC and uh, Michael Simon, who's the president of Tetrad. So you can see that they've gone up through uh, the ranks, especially uh, Gurdeep has been talking. He started off as a technician and, and now he's a manager. So there is this opportunity for growth uh, with uh, the skills and there's a lot of us around. The program, as I'll say, has been around for more than 25 years. So let's uh, get on with our, our presentation. And just to let you know, so besides you, there are uh, I think about 80 people that are signed up online and uh, they um, might be sending to uh, Carmen some Q&A questions. So um, just uh, letting you know that uh, uh, at the end of my presentation, we'll do a bit of QA, uh, and, but as well, Carmen might be uh, yelling out some questions from that came from the online uh, presentation. So what I like to do is just talk about sort of these, uh, or sort of go through these four uh, sections. So st starting off, GIS is everywhere some of the careers, uh, our program specifically, and then we're gonna end it off with questions. Uh, GIS is everywhere. When you uh, came to uh, this presentation today, so here's BCIT. You might not have known where BCIT is. What'd you do? You probably went to Google Maps, typed in BCIT, and then did the uh, directions and say you were down here, uh, downtown, and it would have given you the route either by car or by uh, bus and sky train. So that is sort of one flavor or variation of GIS, and there's many more, and we really dig into um, the different types of things you can do with GIS. So uh, GIS, uh, you know, it's more than just a pretty picture, although we do do things or use things like satellite images or aerial photography. This is a uh, sort of an oblique view over uh, BCIT. I think we're uh, right in about one of these buildings in here at the moment. Lots of different opportunities uh, in GIS. Uh, it's used in things such as in uh, eight, there's avian flu occurrences, so mapping out where bird flu or swine flu uh, is spreading. Uh, things such as um, crime detection, so robbery uh, in England. This is a particular map. There was a uh, professor out at uh, Simon Fraser University developed uh, a crime profiling technique using GIS. So GIS is really spreading out into places that you might not have uh, thought of. A uh, few other things, GIS is heavy into uh, doing things on the web before everything was on the desktop. Uh, now things are progressing just like uh, other industries going to uh, the web. So we have down here, this is a, a Google Earth um, of um, Seattle and the Seahawks uh, play right there, the stadium, uh, as well as uh, different uh, vendors such as ESRI. ESRI is sort of the biggest, I would say the biggest GIS uh, vendor in the world. 
And uh, they do, they started off on the desktop and they've slowly migrated to mobile devices, to the web. So here's one example of one of their, what they call story maps. So in story maps, they're combining um, the maps, uh, of course, as the base, but then they're tagging things like different locations and at each of these different locations it can represent uh, something. In this case, it's uh, where photo radar uh, cameras are in, um, well, maybe the, in Montreal, in the Montreal area. So if you click on each one of those radar camera points, it'll show you a photo of um, what's happening at that location. So there's a lot of that you can do. This is a very simple example as well, but sometimes simple things uh, are very effective. Other things that uh, we have here, so GIS uh, is everywhere. It's, it's here in BC. A lot of municipalities uh, are using GIS. Uh, this one is from the city of Surrey. They have a web map application called Cosmos. And uh, from that we have uh, just an example here. These are the, um, the lot lines, the legal lot lines of uh, people's properties. And there is one property here that's highlighted with a yellow line and there's a red star. Uh, so somebody had clicked with their mouse there and it uh, gave the house address and there's a little report hyperlink. You can click on that and it generated a, say, a PDF report. Now, um, it has lots of information on, say, the past sales, um, what the... Um, cost of the house or the land was over uh, different years, owners, things like that. Um, so with the GIS, you, we can have sort of different levels of, of access. We can tell people that are the, the public, say they can go to Cosmos and find out some basic information about a property, but they can't find out some private stuff. There is private stuff as well, but that is held internally. So uh, GIS, uh, you have the map and one or more databases of information uh, tied into that. I should mention for the people that are here, sorry people that are online, I do have two um, nice BCIT water bottles and I'll ask uh, some questions about this presentation. So there'll be two lucky winners of uh, the water bottles. Okay, next slide. So what is GIS? I'm sure some of you might have already gone to SFU or UBC or some other uh, university and already have a bachelor's uh, degree, uh, while others might uh, not have that much uh, sort of direct knowledge of what, what GIS. Uh, it sort of has a whole lot of things that are associated with it. Uh, in one, one way of looking at it is a tool, is a toolbox and you take out a hammer or a saw or whatever you need in order to do things like build a house. Uh, it's also uh, a technology, so uh, it's the use of certain kinds of software that do spatial operations. It's tied in with databases and all of that kind of good stuff, which again falls into science. So we're a, sort of a science-based uh, technology. Uh, from this technology, you can use it for different things, such as a decision support system. So the municipality of Surrey wants to know um, some information of um, where is... Uh, where is uh, uh, the places that we should be um, updating the roads the most. So where are more of the most potholes happening? So you can use GIS to look at things like people phoning in and saying, oh, there's a big pothole on whatever, 152nd Street and 88th Avenue, and uh, they start compiling all that information. And from that uh, information, they can query the GIS and pull out uh, an answer to that question. Oh, this is the segment of road or section of road within Surrey that we should be updating um, uh, the road, redoing the resurfacing the road. Uh, GIS is getting to be part of mainstream. You're not even knowing about it or thinking about it. So again, the Google Maps example, nobody thinks about that. Uh, um, other people, so Microsoft are in it. All kinds of applications have maps that are now built into it. So I like to say it's an everyday part of our lives. What kinds of careers can you have in GIS? Well, both the private sector and the public sector both uh, use GIS, and it can be anywhere from small business 
Uh, could be a startup, just one person working out of their basement. Uh, could be using GIS all the way up to uh, a large uh, business. And I've got a few examples uh, here as well, both uh, local and, and global. So uh, locally we have, say, our municipal uh, government here, the city of Burnaby, where we are, they use um, GIS. You can go to their website, they have a web map application. Um, another one, so again, staying in BC, we've got uh, the BC government, the Forest Service, um, Ministry of Transportation, they all uh, use GIS. Uh, the people that help us with the SkyTrain, uh, TransLink, uh, they are also users of GIS. If you get hungry, and you want to find a Chipotle Mexico, Mexican grill, they use GIS to help site selection, figuring out where do I put that uh, next Chipotle. Um, other companies, Lafarge, they, they're a multinational, international company. They do uh, things such as concrete. Uh, mining companies uh, traveling around the world, and then environmental uh, consultants. So that's just a very tiny sliver of the kinds of companies or government agencies that use GIS. Okay, different types of people. Uh, you don't all have to be GIS gurus. Uh, for us, we're probably going to be in these two, but uh, to start off with, uh, we, ha we have basic users. It could be somebody within a municipality at a front desk, somebody comes up and says, I need to, f to get um, uh, an outline, the, the boundaries of my, uh, uh, lot in Surrey and uh, that user can then go and type in the person's address and it will generate out uh, a report, a PDF, and they give that to the user. People can now do that on their own so they could be users. You could go to the City of Surrey website and as well get that information. So you don't have to know about GIS uh, in order to use it. It's hopefully uh, the builders and the managers, we've worked hard enough that we've made it easy that you can go through in a logical manner and get that information that you want. Uh, but where BCIT GIS fits in, primarily you're gonna start off uh, as a builder. So we are going to teach you the tools, the technical tools in order to learn how to use GIS, how to do different types of modeling, how to do programming and scripting. So a lot of hands-on work. We have um, uh, only 45 students. We accept uh, every year and we break them up into three sets of 15 and those 15 people really get to know uh, each other well. Um, our labs are, um, uh, we've got one computer uh, for each person uh, in the labs and um, everybody each week you have assignments that you work on say using ArcGIS or some other technology that uh, um, you're being taught for that particular course. Okay, and uh, then we have the managers. Now, you're probably not going to jump straight from uh, the BTEC or the advanced diploma and become a GIS manager. You usually have to build up some experience, but what we do in our program is we also teach you some of these management skills so that you're not... Um, trying to learn on the fly or you have to go back to uh, say UBC or somewhere and learn some management skills. So we do teach you um, some program management. So that's one of the things that I uh, teach in, in the program. Um, and uh, we also teach things like how to do presentations, how to put together presentations, how to uh, write reports, how to do research. So all of the things that a manager uh, would need to do as well as learning all the technical stuff. So that's really quite useful. And again, I think uh, Gurdip mentioned that uh, as well about how that helped him learning how to do presentations. I know students don't like presentations, but we have, uh, you do a few of them, so you're not going to be really good at it, but you're going to at least have that start at it. Okay, examples of GS jobs. So I showed you some of the uh, uh, the companies and government agencies that are using GIS, but I, you're probably wondering, hey, are there any jobs out there right now? I uh, Just uh, earlier this month, I went on to two websites I, I like to use. One is Civic Info BC. Uh, this one has a lot of um, civil jobs, so municipal 
uh, and provincial government, not alone uh, just BC, other, municip or other municipalities outside of BC as well as uh, provinces outside of BC also use that website. And then this uh, wow job. So I'm uh, just taking a look at the types of jobs, uh, engineering assistant to uh, city of Vancouver. Here's a GIS assistant for regional district of Okanagan, Similkameen. Uh, there's a GIS applications developer, city of North Van, uh, GIS CAD technician for Kitimat. Um, on the wow jobs, again, there's just, there's different levels of skills needed. So you could um, be, so here was just a, a, a GIS CAD technician. So that's sort of starting off. You don't have that much knowledge, but then they are looking at things like a GIS analyst one. So you've got, got a year or more years of skill. You might move up uh, into that, uh, or GIS specialist might be a little bit higher than that, analyst. Uh, so there's different places that you can come into uh, an organization or, or move up. So you're not always going to just be this GIS CAD technician. Okay, what kinds of skills do you need for a GIS career? These are the ones that, uh, you know, we are uh, teaching you. So again, using the software, we use ESRI, so the ArcMap software, which again, that's the most popular software. Uh, around a lot of people use it. We also show you some of the open source stuff. Uh, I know some agencies they or or companies they can't afford. Maybe it's a nonprofit they can't afford the uh, ESRI software, but they can handle open source like QGIS. So you do learn um, more than just one uh, software package. Database databases are hugely important. Um, that's where we store all of our data, both spatial and attribute information and um, then link it up uh, with the software. We teach you the analysis skills, so different um, ve uh, vector, raster analysis, different modeling techniques uh, that you go through. Uh, you get a bit of cartography, so the theory of um, learning about map projections and datums. Uh, they're very important. You can't just start making maps and not understand, say, why does this map and that map look different and then things don't seem to line up. Uh, you need to understand a little bit about map projections and datums and things like that. So we'll, we, we help you out in there. Uh, programming, programming is getting to be a larger and larger uh, component uh, in GIS, uh, part, partly in due to the web. So building lots of uh, say web map applications or if you've got your wonderful smartphone like this, there's lots of people developing apps uh, for your phone or for your tablets or wherever you go. So uh, we do take you, we show you how to develop apps for phones. We do show you how to develop uh, web mapping applications. And uh, GIS also works with other types of data. So we um, don't always um, make you work with one kind of data. We give you other um, experience. So you get to work with AutoCAD and then uh, how do you take AutoCAD data, say, and bring it into uh, the ArcGIS software, as well as what, what's remote sensing. Some people might not have heard that term before. It's basically aerial imagery, whether that imagery is from uh, an air photo or it can be come from a digital camera, uh, say, on a plane or an air or helicopter, or it could be come from one of the orbiting uh, satellites. So this is a great source of information to get into the GIS, use, do things such as change detection. And uh, so again, we, we will show you how to do that, do the analysis as well as bring the data into GIS. And then again, I mentioned about the web applications and uh, developing those. Okay, skills for a GIS career. And I think Gurdeep also mentioned a few of these. Uh, working in teams, we find that uh, is very useful. So you do get cha chances to work on your own, but we also have you work in teams uh, so that, uh, and sometimes maybe you might be the manager, the, the project manager, and everybody else is working for you, and other times you are uh, one of the people working for uh, the project uh, manager on different um, types of uh, assignments. Communication uh, is important uh, as well. Again, we make you do presentations like I'm doing up here. 
just so that you have that experience, know what is, how do, how do I make a good presentation? What kinds of things should I show or shouldn't I show? Um, and you might not appreciate it at the very beginning and you'll probably, probably hate it, but uh, over time you'll find as you go from that GIS CAD technician and you're moving up the ladder, you're going to be needing to do more and more uh, presentations and communicating. I didn't mention independent problem solving. This is probably one of the, the main things when sponsors or people come to us and they say, well, the student wants to work for us, are we thinking of hiring them? You know, how are, are they able to solve problems independently? So we try to give you uh, interesting problems to try and solve either on your own or uh, with groups. Uh, we don't want you to always just come to us and say, can you tell me the answer to that problem? So we try to promote you um, solving uh, GIS problems. And again, there's more than uh, one solution. I always tell my students. So I might guide them a little bit, but I hope that they can figure out or they'll develop a solution that uh, makes sense for them. Uh, let's see, interpersonal skills in GIS, you're always having to, to work with or deal with people, especially say if you're working in a consulting company to talk to clients, find out what they need uh, from that uh, say output map or web map application. Uh, you get to be creative, so maps are kind of cool. You can make them look, design them uh, how you want. They're not just uh, a table of numbers. Well, they are maybe in the background, but how do you visualize that information? Um, you can put a, on a bit of your own creativity uh, to that. And uh, you do need to be organized for uh, a GIS uh, career. And I mentioned being organized uh, because you can't just have your GIS data sort of scattered all over the place and you don't know um, the vintage, say, is this my newest data set for the uh, city of Surrey Roads or is this one? Uh, if you don't can't keep yourself organized, your data is going to get scrambled up and you might be giving people um, information that uh, uh, is not the most current. So lots of uh, skills that are important for GIS. And what about getting jobs? Well, we did do a survey, so this is in 2010 and the 2011 uh, graduate students. And we wanted to find out a few things. Two of the um, that I'm presenting here today is first the time it took to obtain a GIS job. And you'll see that 28% um, of them had a job before they graduated. And how did that happen? Well, um, one of the things that we do with our students is um, in the January till either end of May or June time frame, the students will work with a sponsor, whether it's a private company or uh, a government agency, to, to work on either a project or a practica with the sponsor. And um, for 28% of them, they probably are hired by that sponsor. So the sponsor gets to find out how well you work, how much GIS skills you know, and hey, maybe you're a good fit uh, with the people that are already within their agency. So 28 get a job before or get hired before um, graduating. Another 28% get uh, the job within three months, uh, the rest four to six months, so another 28. So there's only 16% that take uh, more than uh, six months. So I think that's a pretty good stat for being able to get jobs uh, in GIS. And I'm um, looking at starting salaries as well. So um, we start off, usually most people are going, going to be in the less than, well, 20% are less than 40,000. So that's probably the entry level GIS CAD technician. Not a lot of um, skills yet, other than what they've uh, learned here at BCIT. But as you slowly get more skills and knowledge, there's the 40 to 49,000 uh, range at 32%. Uh, and then there's this big whack at 40%, between 50 uh, to 59,000. So I was mentioning that we do a lot of things teaching about programming, um, mobile devices, web stuff, database. If you have that bent that you really like databases and you really like programming, uh, your wage is probably going to start in this or the higher one. 
Uh, if you're not that much interested in, in the programming side and you want to do sort of the, get, you know, just producing maps and things, then you'll probably start off in that uh, around the $40,000 range. Okay, and I just, again, pulled up a few other um, pieces of information of different types of GIS uh, people. So starting off a GIS technician, I went to this payscale.com website and uh, it showed from them, so this is in, Cana in, in Canada, in Canadian dollars, a, the median wage a GIS technician uh, is getting according to them is about $49,000. Uh, if you move up to a GIS analyst, you'll see the median has now popped up to 55000 And uh, if you are a GIS manager, so if you're like Gurdeep or or Michael Simon, your median wage looks like it's almost uh, eighty-one thousand uh, dollars there. But you also see that there are there are uh, ranges up there. So like the could be all the way up to say one hundred and seven thousand dollars for some GIS managers. So not a bad career. Oh, so let's talk about BCIT's uh, GIS program. So we started off in in nineteen eighty-seven uh, with our program. Uh, and we have our two things. We've got the advanced diploma and uh, the Bachelor of Technology that I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, and again, I was mentioned earlier, we have 45 uh, students uh, per year that go through the full-time program. And we also have uh, a lot more than that that are also doing the online part-time studies. But if you think about, say, 40 students a year graduating for 25 years, there's a lot of BCIT grads that are in the BC area as well as uh, across Canada. Um, and one thing they're going to do, because they know how much skills that they learn, they're going to start looking uh, for you. So once one BCIT grad gets into somewhere, they tend to start bringing other BCIT grads uh, in as well. So we do have a very good repu reputation. We work you very hard as... Uh, uh, if you're able to talk to some other uh, of our students from the past, uh, you don't have a time for a social life. We work you really hard, but you get to learn lots of good things. And uh, you then get to find, like I said, all those job opportunities. Um, courses and programs. So uh, I did say that we do have the, uh, the full-time program. So uh, we have face-to-face. -face. Uh, we also do a, an online part-time studies. Uh, program. Oh, we do have a few also face-to-face -face, part-time. Um, and our two programs, our two main programs that we have are called the Advanced Diploma and the Bachelor of Technology. So um, how many people here have a bachelor's degree already or they've done two years in university? Okay. So to get into our, our program, most people already have a bachelor's uh, uh, degree. If they do have a bachelor's degree, uh, what most people do is go into what we call our uh, advanced diploma. Uh, I'll get into that. It's basically just the one year, like Gurdeep did, start in September and in uh, the May of the following year. Uh, the people that have, say, done the two years of university but they don't have uh, a diploma or they don't have their degree yet, uh, most of those will go and uh, get our Bachelor of Technology, which does the same courses as the Advanced Diploma, but there's a few more extra courses that they need to take, and I'll, I'll show uh, what those are as well. Okay. Uh, part-time courses, again, uh, we have the, for the part-time. Uh, there's just a few that are based here at uh, the BCIT Burnaby campus. Most of our courses are online, which is nice for you because... Uh, you could be, uh, there's all the online people, hello again. Uh, if you are up in Fort McMurray or um, in Fort St. John or wherever you are, uh, you can be taking our program and graduate uh, through the part-time studies. Uh, you don't have to uh, take or you don't have to go uh, through part-time studies and do the bachelor or the advanced diploma. Sometimes you might only want to take a few courses so you can do that as well through part-time studies. So if you wanted to take the intro to GIS or ArcGIS Level 1, you could do that without having to go through 
our full program. But the full program is there available for you online if you want it. Uh, the other cool thing is, say, if you take some of these courses and you say, hey, I do want to become a uh, GIS technician and I'm going to do that advanced diploma, those courses that you've already took, you can apply them against um, the full program so that you don't have to take them over again, assuming that you've taken them recently. If you took them 15 years ago, then it's no good. If you took them two years ago, um, then yes, we'll give you an exemption for those. Okay, so I talked about uh, uh, these as well. So advanced diploma, you already have a degree. You just want to get that hands-on GIS skills. Uh, the Bachelor of Technology, so if you don't have that bachelor's degree, I uh, should note that uh, if, the, you, if there are some international applicants uh, out there, uh, you do need to have your um, credentials wherever you took, say, your university or college to see um, that you fit the, um, the minimum criteria that BCIT admissions has for our program. Okay, we do have a new program, and I, I am just going to talk very peripherally about it because that's not the main goal of um, this presentation today. This presentation, or for those of you that want to be uh, GIS technicians, but some people might already have a great career. They're a civil engineer, but they keep hearing about GIS, and they want to know a little bit about it, become a little bit dangerous. So we just started off um, uh, this semester what we call the advanced certificate. So uh, you take nine courses, you get the certificate. It makes you dangerous enough that you can talk to a GIS technician and understand um, if they give you back what you're asking for or um, if you need them to change something, you can talk to them in GIS speak. So if you want to find out more about the advanced certificate, we're going to have another presentation like this on uh, November the 24th. Okay, so our entrance requirements, what are they for the ADP uh, and the BTEC? They're basically identical. So uh, most people will come to us with a university or college degree. You can't come straight out of high school and go into our program. So um, most people do the university college degree first or um, they have an associate degree or at least two years of university study or they have come from another um, they could come from another department within, say, BCIT, or maybe they're from SAIT or NAIT, and they already have a diploma in some technology. Those are all valid um, routes to get into either the advanced diploma or the Bachelor of Technology. And um, I was saying there's a little bit of differences in the courses uh, between them. Both the uh, advanced diploma and the Bachelor of Technology, um, you do take the same technical courses. So, so there's 45 credits of courses here and 45 there. Um, you do both take management courses, although you see the Bachelor of Technology, they have to take a few more management courses. I did mention in uh, January, in the winter session, um, you will be working on a project or a practicum uh, with a sponsor. You'll see for the advanced diploma, uh, they can do either what they call a project where you do the work here at BCIT or a practicum where you go and sit in somebody's office, say City of Burnaby working in their GIS department uh, for that semester. So you have that option, those two options for the advanced diploma. For the Bachelor of Technology, the way that the program works is you have to do a project. You don't have that practicum option. So once you've completed um, these uh, technical skills and you've done your project or practica for the ADP, ta-da, you've graduated uh, typically either the uh, end of May or the end of June the following year. The Bachelor of Technology people, you've done the same thing as these students, uh, albeit the project, but you then you need to do these extra things. So there was these extra four management credit courses. You do need to get 12 credits in, in uh, some liberal arts courses, such as, say, a philosophy uh, course. So we do teach these liberal arts uh, courses. And you do need to get the six months of GIS work experience. So this is something you have to find uh, on, on your own. Uh, you might be, could ask us, and we could give you some ideas of places uh, to look 
But um, after you get your six months of GIS work experience and all of these things, you can then apply for your Bachelor of Technology. Okay. Uh, advanced Diploma Program Delivery. So we do have, uh, for the Advanced Diploma, I was mentioning here's our, the full-time program, which is what we're doing uh, right now here at BCIT. So again, it starts every September. Uh, the intake for it for next year, so starting September 2017, the intake for that starts um, November 1st. So within uh, a week. The registration for next September is going to start and uh, you go through uh, the BCIT website to do that. Uh, when you do that registration, it's going to ask you things such as uh, your university or, and or high school transcript and other information. When you do go, if you decide that you would like to say go for the advanced diploma or the BTEC, please try and get together all the information that you need uh, to apply. Uh, because we do not, or the admissions office doesn't process your application until all of the information um, that they require is supplied to you. Okay, uh, it does take, um, or our progress, it has 45 uh, seats we take every year. It starts November 1st. We're usually full uh, by the end of December. So getting all your information together soon and uh, getting into the system is very good because it's on sort of a first come, first serve. As long as you meet all the criteria, um, you are into the system or you're in for uh, September of the following year. Um, if you want to do, you can go through the part-time studies route. So on the part-time studies route, uh, you don't necessarily have to start in September. You could, in theory, start taking courses in January. Okay, so you're not fixed to starting in September like you are uh, in the full time. So the online, uh, you could start uh, in, in January taking uh, courses uh, throughout. Uh, we've got a, a fall, a winter, and a spring semester. And depending on how many courses you take, in theory, you could finish um, the advanced diploma within two years. But... We know that people that are usually doing advanced uh, diploma online, they probably have another job, they're married, things like that. So we give them up to five years to complete their advanced diploma online. Looking at the, uh, the Bachelor of Technology. So again, that opens up November 1st. So if you want to go the, the BTEC route, uh, you can do that. The online is the same thing with the, the, the advanced diploma online. You can start at the start of any one of the semesters. So if you want to start in January, uh, you can do that as well. Most of the courses for both, again, the BTEC and the ADP online or, or ADP are online. There are a few if you want to come in to BCIT um, that you can do here, and those are usually held uh, in the evening. Uh, through the, the, the BTEC, because there's those extra courses and things you need to do, uh, we say that sort of the, the soonest you could finish it would be three years to do the, the BTEC online um, uh, or through part-time studies fully uh, up to, and then we give you up to seven years. So it's got a little bit more longer timeline compared to uh, the ADP. Okay, our facilities and teaching that we have here, so if you go through the full-time program, uh, we do make sure that there are, uh, each person in the lab has their own computer. Uh, we do have a dedicated uh, GIS lab and it has a swipe card so only GIS students can get into there. It's got dual monitors uh, and we have 24-7 access to it. That being said, uh, we do a lot of things now through the web. We have a Citrix environment so that if you've got, as long as you've got high speed internet access, you've got uh, a laptop or a tablet, you can log in from your house, wherever you are, and you can work on your ArcGIS assignment, and uh, then you can submit it online. So you don't necessarily, in the past, uh, before we had our Citrix environment, yeah, there could be students working at 2 a.m. in one of our, our uh, labs, but now you could be working at 2 a.m. at home. 
Uh, again, industry standard software. So we're using uh, what industry is using. Uh, we have a program advisory committee that we meet with twice a year, and they tell us, you know, where, what the trends are, what software, what programming languages um, people should be using in order to get the best jobs in GIS. So we, we're always on the bleeding edge uh, in the BCIT uh, GIS uh, department. Okay, yes, small class sizes, so I mentioned 45, and you're broken out into those sets of 15. Uh, one to one student computer ratio. All the instructors, we all come from industry and uh, we all have many years of experience. Some of us are specialists in municipal, some of us are remote sensing, some of us are, are map making people. So we have all kinds of skills and contacts um, that is very useful for you because we can say help put you together with a, a sponsor when you have to do your project or your practica. And um, a lot of integrated e-learning, so lots of things you can do online, doing things together with other students. Uh, it's not just sitting reading books. Okay. Uh, before you decide if you want to be a GIS uh, geek like me, I think it's a cool job. Um, take a look at some of the things. Um, I talked about what kinds of companies, government agencies are using GIS. I showed you some of the job opportunities, so if some of those... Uh, sounded interesting to you and um, then um, you know do you have interests or, or attitude or aptitude in spatial thinking some people aren't aren't that good at spatial thinking um, if you get lost very easily that maybe that isn't a good job for you I see everybody that found this room here you have spatial thinking so you would be good candidates for the GIS program and um, other things, readiness, so some technical skills. I do, we do do a lot of programming and scripting, uh, different programming languages like Python and Java and PHP uh, will teach you. So uh, some of the things that you might want to do on your own, you could apply in November 1st to get into the program. But in order to get yourself ready for September the following year, you might do some things like try and um, take some of the free online uh, Python or Java courses uh, that there are, or some other things that I didn't mention. Uh, for the PTS, I, I said for the uh, part-time studies program, you can take courses throughout the year. There's nothing stopping you from saying in September, why, or in uh, January, why not take the intro to GIS or maybe the ArcGIS level one course so that when September rolls around, you can be automatically exempted from those courses. So you're not going to have to do nine courses. In starting in September, you're down to only seven courses. You have a, a, a lighter workload. Okay. Yes, and uh, sort of you have to be fairly proficient uh, reading and writing and speaking in English because you're going to be needing to use all those skills at some point in. Uh, our uh, different courses. Okay, so questions, if you do have questions about uh, admissions, so there is the program advising uh, that uh, is available, uh, so that's for all different programs, uh, but as well as if you have like really super specific stuff for uh, GIS that you can either talk to me, that's me, Carl, program head, uh, so there's my phone number and email address, as well as through the part-time studies, if you were thinking of maybe doing the part-time studies route, uh, we have Carmen who is sitting at the back being quiet, and there is her phone number and her email address. And uh, like a chicken here. Oh, okay, well, typing very fast. So one of the things, yes, if you can type, that will help as well. Because you've got, we, I make you do lots of reports in my course. Okay, and let's see, is that, yes, so there's, a, that's the end of the presentation. So what I was going to do is, just before I open it up to questions, and hopefully answers from me and Carmen, I know you've all been eyeing these two nifty water bottles that say BCIT on it. So I had two questions based on um, the presentation. So the, the first question for this first bottle is, I had a slide that showed the city of Surrey 
uh, web map application and it had a name on it. What is it? Cosmos. Cosmos. There you go. So I did have another slide that showed a bunch of, it showed logos of both government agencies and private companies. And there was four different private companies. If somebody can tell me the name of one of the private companies. Warehouser. Warehouser, you are correct. Okay. So now that we've finished the fun stuff, we can start grilling me and or Carmen. So does anybody have any questions? When you say you accept 45 people, is that just, is this 45 in the advanced diploma and 45 in the Bachelor of Technology? Or 45? It's 40, 45 altogether. Typically per um, each year, about 40 to 41 of them are the advanced diploma and about four or five are the um, Bachelor of Technology. Now that being said, so say it hits the end of December and we've hit our 45, you can still, people can still keep applying, people out in the back there, you can still pe keep applying. Uh, we take in a, another 45 on the wait list because you never know, the first 45 people, some of them, they might be moving away, family situation changes. So even if you are a little bit late of getting things in, and they say you're on the wait list, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get in. There still is that possibility. Next question. Um, I was reading online <coughs> on the application page um, that one of the documents that you need for applicants or applying is um, if you haven't finished your degree, to have a, a confirmation of enrollment for your last semester. And I was just wondering if you need that right away Yeah, I know there's, there is that situation. I'm not 100% sure because I'm not the admissions person, but I think you still, like you get your official transcript up to the point that you have it, and it might show that you're still taking those courses, but probably still talk to admissions. Yes. Wow, what quite, quite people. Yes. Some years we have zero people dropping out. Um, other years, the most I've had is two. Since I, I've been here for teaching here full time for seven years, I've been teaching part time more than twenty five. So the, since I've been here, the, the in the full full time teaching, uh, two people dropping out has been the most I've seen. Typically, it's one one, and that's usually because somebody they're they're moving away or their family situations changed. Yes. I am going to say yes and no at the moment. Um, right now that is under uh, discussion. That's what we call laddering. And um, right now the way that it's at BCIT, it's you can't ladder to from the ADP to the BTEC, but I'm in discussions with them at the very moment. And uh, that might change shortly. Um, for the 16% that don't find jobs within like the first couple of months, um, is there more support? Is there further support from BCIT in finding jobs, or are they kind of pre-graduated? Well, now? if they don't contact, say, contact one of the instructors and say, "Well, I haven't found a job," and can you give me some pointers or something? We don't know that. So, but when, if people contact me, I am, I'm always trying to give people ideas of companies, people they should be talking to, things like that. Um, you're saying like the face-to-face, -face, like the pro-rats mostly, like in the evening and that. What kind of, what does like a kind of a week of classes look like? For the full-time program? Um, it'll go, well, Monday to Friday, of course. Um, 
The earliest our courses start is 8.30 in the morning, and the latest they can end is 5.30. So uh, some of the days you might do an 8.30 to 5.30, but that's not going to be every... Sometimes it might be you ending at 3.30 or 4.30. Uh, Wednesdays are only... Uh, our courses end at uh, 1.30 on, on Wednesdays. There's a... Uh, I think there was a student union type thing that happened many years ago, and... So every Wednesday, all across the campus, not just the GIS, but all of the, 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 the programs, they stop. And then the students have the afternoon to say, I don't know, work on assignments and things like that. Is it designed for fitness? Designed for fitness, designed yes. For fitness. So you're doing for intramural sports. Oh, sorry. Finger exercises on a keyboard, but um, generally it was designed for you to go to gym and throw a ball around. Yes, and they're, they, they, just to let you know, in, in June this year, they upgraded the, the, the weight room, so they've got all, all these fantastic brand new machines and exercise bikes and stuff. So. Is this also pop dumpster? Hmm? Is this also a pop dumpster? <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, that you know, works your arm muscle, the bicep, <laughs> right? Biceps. Anyway, yeah. Um, with the part-time ADP program, if you have another job, uh, how does the industry project work for your practicum? Well, if you are working and you're doing the part-time studies and you have to do, uh, you're doing a project or a practicum, uh, we try to discourage doing it within your company. Uh, we try to ask you to do it with somebody else, and um, uh, I'm. The course that I teach, I try to help the students find those sponsors. So I'll work with, with you or the other students and say, well, he, I do find a bunch every year, and then I'll work with you to find other ones if none of those ones sort of match up. Does that answer it? Uh, kind of. Um, so would you have to take time off work to go to these places and like, do the, the project? Or? Well... You probably need to, say, work after your normal work hours yep. uh, on that and then spend time on, on weekends as well. Uh, basically, you, you have to make up 45 days of effort <clears throat> for a project or a practicum. But you found, like, sponsors are pretty flexible with, like, okay, you can work after your regular working hours? Well, maybe I should ask... Carmen, who's our part-time studies person, uh, if she can comment about students students that have jobs and they are doing, they have to do a project or a practica. Well, a project. If you're doing a project, that's generally on your own time. It's just like any other course. So you schedule Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, sort of something, whatever, to get your hours in. If you're doing a practica, some students in the past have um, chosen block practicas because then they take a leave of absence from work or they quit their part-time job or their job and they go and do their practica, but practicas are unpaid, so that one's a little bit dicey. Um, other students have negotiated with their employer that they take so many days off so they negotiate a, a schedule that they can go. So there are some variations. But generally, you do a project, because that's your own time. Yeah, and we supply, again, you with our software, say the ArcGIS and other software, through our Citrix environment, so that you can be at home on your, on your laptop doing your, doing your project. Well, what I do for practicas is um, I, at the start of every uh, September, I'll talk to past sponsors and try to find new sponsors, and I'll put up a list for the students, and some of them could be like Ducks Unlimited Canada or Ecotrust Canada or City of Burnaby, 
um, Township of Langley. And the students will then look at that and based on their own personal preferences, they will then apply to those. So three or four students could apply for different ones and then the um, sponsor will interview those students and it could be just like an online phone call phone or they might bring you over or they might come over to BCIT and figure out which student or students they want because sometimes they take more than one student. Uh, and on the other thing, so there's that list, uh, but I usually don't have enough um, projects or practica for everybody, but some students already have an idea of where they would like to work. So I would talk to, with the student and to that potential sponsor and see if we can work out a schedule to do some GIS project or practica work. Uh, well, it's not during the summer. We do it during the actual school term. So we have, um, uh, say, starting in, well, starting right now, I try working with the students, finding a sponsor. So most of the students will then start their project or practica in January, which is the start of the winter semester. And uh, we have what's called uh, a gradual mode practicum, where they actually go to the sponsor's office and work or a project where they do the work here. If they're in either of those two modes, they, they work f uh, from the start of January till spring break, so that's about middle of March. They just do, every Friday is dedicated to working for their sponsor. So Monday to Thursday, they're doing classes, assignments, exams, but Friday is their sponsor time. After spring break, it then goes to Thursdays and Fridays working with the sponsor Monday to Wednesday doing their regular lecture lab stuff. And then after those five weeks, the last five weeks, they would have finished all of their classwork. All they have to do for the last five weeks, Monday to Friday, is their project or their practica. And at the, at the end of that, if you were, uh, um, through the ADP or their, well, through the ADP, you're done. The BTECs, they still have to go and do those additional uh, courses. Now, that being said, we do also have a variation of the practica. So we, the first one I told you is called the gradual because things go gradually. There's also what we call block mode practica. So in the block mode, you would start in the middle of April. So after you finish all of your coursework, you will start... Um, as soon as that finishes the first Monday after and you work nine weeks straight and that takes you almost to the end of June. And uh, you, you spend 100% of your time over at the sponsor's office doing work for them. So the, at that point you'd be graduating uh, in, at the end of June, not at the end of May like the other ADP students. Um, no, I th well, it depends. Like some people have, have come from out of town, like maybe they live originally in Nelson and they would like to do their practicum in Nelson. So they, for them, doing the block mode is better. The other benefit of doing block mode is you have all your Fridays off till spring break. So you've got extra time to do homework and then you've got the Thursday Fridays off so you can even do more homework. So that, that's the other benefit of going, going block mode. Yep. Yeah, I noticed uh, that with the, the BTEC, there's a, or sorry, the uh, advanced diploma, there's the 7111 course attached to GIS. Yep. It's not on the other one. Um, do you get a full course of CAD in the BTEC? Looks like Carmen wants to answer that one. No, she doesn't. Okay, well, we have two, two CAD courses. We've got uh, the CAD for GS, which uses AutoCAD here at BCIT in the full-time program. If you're doing through the part-time studies, our CAD course is using MicroStation, and it's a different course number. Is there any online questions, or are the online people really quiet? Oh, oh okay, good stuff. So, Sorry, I've been answering the online questions. Okay. 
we are looking into offering AutoCAD part-time studies, but we're running into a technology issue with the software. MicroStation runs distributed in apps anywhere better than AutoCAD. So. Well, if there's no more questions, I can let you go, or if you're too shy, you can uh, uh, come up here and talk to either me or, or to Carmen and say goodbye to everybody on the online uh, sessions now.